Good morning, everyone. I am Rolf Nolasco Rubin Pijo, Professor of Pastoral Theology and Spiritual Formation here at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. Thank you for joining us today. G Talk is a space for soulful conversation. It is about engaging in God talk in a manner that is personal, practical, embodied, and open-ended. For today's G Talk, we are privileged to have Dr. Sabrina Mueller as our featured guests, and she's going to be joining us from Switzerland today. Dr. Mueller is the managing director of the University Research Priority Program called Digital Religions and a researcher and lecturer in practical theology at the University of Zurich. Her recent research is about religious experiences, digital theology, contextual feminist and post-colonial theologies, and pioneering and the future of the parish. Dr. Mueller is co-chair of the Practical Theology Unit of the American Academy of Religion and a member of various learned societies, such as the International Society for Empirical Research in Theology and the Digital Society Initiative at the University of Zurich, among others. Her scholarly work includes religious experience and its transformational power, deadly real mourning and accompaniment after suicide, and lived theology impulses for a pastoral theology of empowerment. For this edition of G Talk, Dr. Mueller will share with us her experience as one of the principal investigators for the international and ecumenical study on church practice in the corona period, which is something that we're still trying to um, grapple with, which is part of really a much larger research interest that she has in the area of religious influencers and digital church and social media, and spiritual and religious apps, and the question on how the post-digital shapes and changes church, religious communities, and faith. We hope that Dr. Mueller's presentation and our subsequent conversation afterwards will provide opportunities for ongoing dialogue at home, your church, and other social spaces regarding the intersection of digitality with faith or religious life. Welcome uh, this morning, and welcome to Garrett and G Talk, Dr. Sabrina Mueller. And Dr. Nolaska, thank you so much for your kind introduction. Okay. And I will just share my screen. And if you are ready, I can start. Yes, we're ready. Okay. Um, Dr. Nolaska, you asked me to share parts of my research insights into research on digital theology and I use examples from hom homiletics, digital worship, um, religious influences and spiritual apps. So I try to cover a lot of things in a short time and I'm sure we can um, dig deeper afterwards. So what I want to do um, this morning is first give you a presentation of the institutional perspective. I will do this with the research, contact research, so churches online in times of corona, then a more individual institutional perspective, and then one on digital theology. I often call it beyond the pulpit. Mm. So it's very liquid um, forms of spirituality and theology that we see there. Um, as you already hear, I'm from Switzerland, you introduced me, so some parts are um, in German, but I will translate them because we have some calculations only in German. So very important to say what I'm presenting here is mostly a Western European perspectives and as well examples from this context. I'm sure other contexts can learn from this, but just to mention where my perspective and my research is mainly coming from. <clears throat> so institutional and fluid religious communication practices often blend. And I'd like to show you a graph. I know it's in German, but you will see what I try to say. What we often have is we have in the middle a digital religious practice. So that's what people do. It's a spiritual practice. 
And when you look at the phenomenon we have, you can see that there are different segments of this practice. We have often an analog communal practice. So this is the, the church or the parish church. And then when you look at the graphic up here, an individual religious practice. So many things we do um, at church are in this first segment. And the first part of um, some data I will present from the context study are actually always data you need to read in this segment. So it is between the um, uh, parish church or between churches and individual analog practice. So church practice and individual analog practice. Then um, what we see the next one I will present more is in this segment it's closer to an individual religious practice and I would talk about we call it in German the sinfluencer it doesn't have anything to do with sin but sin in German means meaning so about religious influencer and um, that have the main goal to communicate um, meaning and religious meaning. This is more the liquid. And then on this side, between the individual religious practice and we have a digital communal practice are often very liquid things like religious apps. And what we have as well, when we look what's going on online is we have a digital discourse practice. So this is more about discourses you see on hashtags, we have a network, it's called the NEAT network, that's a network that um, kind of brings different influences into contact. And we have some things that you often see in the area of podcast. This is a combination between analog church practice and the digital discourse practice. And um, you see there are uh, um, podcasts that are there, blogs and so on that try to foster the discourse and are not connected like especially to individual people so it's more about the discourse so it always um the question behind this graph is as well where do the relationships go to but i will show this again and again and you will see and uh, more what i mean by this the first perspective I want to show you is, again, the institutional perspective during the lockdown. So preaching from the digital pulpit, and it's from the um, Contoc 1 study. And um, what's important is many of the results do make the most sense in a context where you still have a state church. And that's for Central Europe and many parts. So when I go back, we're first talking about this segment, contact and the analog church and what did they do during COVID. Um, contact was a study that um, we did as a core team of six people from different universities. And the idea was it called um, churches online in times of corona what we wanted to see is what do churches do during covid and we gathered data from 19 countries and had around 7000 responses and so the core question was how do churches and pastor priests handle the crisis the lockdown and what forms of digitalization do we find so what happens with the church um, so this was the main question. So when we look, and that's what I said, I'm sorry, this is in German, but um, what we ask is, what did you have digital forms of worship before the lockdown? What we see is a significant increase in digital worship services during the lockdown. So we asked, did you offer digital worship services prior to the assembly ban? If you look at the graph, you see that nearly 90% said, no, we didn't have any digital forms of worship and a little bit more than 10% said, yes, we already had some. So there was an increase, an immense increase. Um, what we looked at as well is what forms of worship service did people do during um, the lockdown? 
And what we saw is that this first one was mainly word services. So just preaching um, some organs. The next was more um, spiritual, like desi things. Then only very few did prayer services, a little bit more um, services, communal services where people um, could participate. Seven, only 70 meditation. Then you see the Eucharist or communion was 121. So you see that what people tended to do was quite traditionally. They just used the church building and they started streaming what they always did. And this is, we got tons and tons of services of empty churches where they just had the pastor there um, giving the service and just streaming this. Um, what we saw as well, that was um, surprising. These 196 were phone um, services. So people calling each other or doing service over phone. Very few, all those are very few more participatory formats. So there wasn't done a lot on that. Um, the interesting part is what we saw during COVID is all churches started streaming their services. But when you ask actually the pastors what became less important or less significant, it was the service. So there is a paradox in the data what pastors think was significant, but what churches did. So they did much more of streaming, but in the opinion of um, people at church, this became less significant. So this was more the institutional perspective during the lockdown and responses from clergy. So what we saw as well by asking the clergy, so here is the workload tends to decrease during the lockdown. And this was surprising for us. You see a little bit. So th those people said it was much less. And we had here, it's ecumenical. That's just German data, very important. So from Austria, Germany, and Switzerland, Catholic and Reformed. And there you see that they said, we did have a lot less to do or a little less to do. And this part is, uh, it was close to the same. And there were less people said, oh, I had a lot more to do. The interesting part is that this corresponds with some data we had that people said, I was encouraged to become more creative. And what we expect or what we think is because people felt, oh, I do have more time and room to think through certain things, I didn't have the time anymore. Um, so that's what just I tried to say. This is the graph with the creativity. And here you see Sweden, Great Britain, Switzerland, and Germany. The interesting part that when we compare those countries, the blue is feel creative. Many people felt a lot more creative and felt like, wow, we do have room to to create things, to try things. And um, we even got the answer that um, quite a lot of the pastors said, I finally have the time to do what my job is, why I picked up this job. I have more time for spiritual care, for counseling, and so on and so on. So it's kind of the administ administrative part became less. Um, criteria for continuing digital activities, so worship services. Um, this was as well one data set that we looked at. And here you see the comparison of Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. The interesting part is what happens or what fosters the wish to become or to um, do continuing digital things. One part is teamwork. Then very high is we see chances in the digital communication. So people who see a chance are much more likely to go on. Then um, they feel like they have a mission to do. This is as well very high. Then um, 
they see the, um, the workload is a little bit less. I have time than creativity and I'm um, content with what I do. So those aspects kind of increase the continual digital activities. And um, if you look at that, again, that's only Switzerland. You see that when you ask for the satisfaction, it's not a very high number, but you see that um, people who are working with the team are more satisfied with their digital activities than people without the team. So those pastors who worked with a team to do the services felt more creative, more engaged, were more satisfied with what they did. Um, the same with the, uh, not the same, but what we see is with mission, online forms of virtual reach people with whom we would otherwise have no contact. And that was a very, very surprising um, stat for us because in Sweden and in Switzerland and in Germany, um, there is a culture where we don't talk about mission and about discipleship. Um, so we expect those numbers to be very low because people say, well, we just be our state churches. So this isn't so important. But what we found is that the experience they made that they get in contact with people that normally would not come to church were significant for the online activities. So that was part one. <laughs> now I'd like to dive much more into the individual institutional perspective and the meaning of religious influencers. What you see here is, and that's already, this picture speaks a lot, this a person is called the pastor made of plastic, and he's an ordained minister in the um, Evangelical Lutheran Church in Germany. Very interesting is that you see many more pastors on Instagram and social media wearing, wearing like the dog collar and so on. In situation, you wouldn't normally wear it. So here he um, was driving a car, a new car but he had the dog color on. And so when you look, um, I would say what we saw in the first part is it's a communication of the digital pulpit. So we take the traditional church more into the digital and a lot of things we do is streaming. When we go to the question of the influencers, we are, you see on this graphic, closer to the individual religious practice. And just to narrow it down, my focus is mainly um, pastoral influences and religious influences connected to a denomination. So the data I'm presenting now or the observations is from this perspective. So we are here. And what we see is that the pulpit or the communication of the gospel gets more and more into the everyday life. So the house or the living room of a past becomes more important because she might just make a little morning prayer at seven o'clock on Instagram from her living room. Or the interesting part is that everyday life, like caring for the children um, as a single mother and being a pastor, how do I combine this? So such questions become more important in this discourse. Um, so religious influences in reformed churches in Germany and Switzerland. And what you see here is a very famous couple and it's called Anders Amen. Translation would be different Amen. And this is a queer pastoral couple um, who is on YouTube, but as well on Instagram. So Steffi and Ellen Radke and their daughter. And what they do is they um, are traditional pastors, but they do as well vlogs on Instagram. So they have now part-time um, hiring for creating a digital queer church 
and the other one is they are in traditional parish churches. So you always see this combination of the analog and the digital, and you see how how much it becomes much more post-digital or hybrid. And the more and more we go, like with, with the first part I showed you, we can still say, oh, this is analog, this is digital. But already here, we have to talk about the post-digital world because it, it inspires each other so much and you can't defer it anymore. anymore. What we see is religious influences or pastors and lay people with a conviction that digital presence fulfills the de denominational mission. So they have, again, this conviction. We had it as well the, um, for the attractivity of going on with digital things, that the, having a mission is very important. Often with those influences we research it's um, very close connected to a denomination what we see as well and that's why i use this picture this is called um josephine teske and her instagram account is called seligkeit thing and she has more than forty thousand followers this is a lot for germany and switzerland and the very interesting part is that she was a pastor in a in a small town but her digital activity is quite huge. And what happened is that she is now part of the EKD, so the leading organization of the um, Evangelical Lutheran Church and the Reformed Church in Germany. So what we see is that authority changes, leadership structure changes. So often... Um, based on numbers and as well the question of authenticity um the influence changes so to become a part of the leadership team in the ecd you needed to have a phd or be a professor or whatever but now it's much more the influence question and preaching beyond the pulpit so the pulpit in the everyday life and that's interesting part you see a combination of really everyday life messy kitchens that we all know laundry and at the same time you see the um, dark color over there like on these pictures if you look and those are just a few of the digital influences we have here um from there, and I'm sorry, I can only always present little pieces. There would be tons to say to each section, but I like to go to the spirituality beyond the pulpit. And that's the one that's even the least well known and not much researched yet. And here we are in the section of um, spiritual and religious and mindfulness apps. We have prayer apps, insight time or calm we have apps from churches and so on and so on. What we see there, this is often in the individual religious practice section or spiritual section, and in a, and not always, but sometimes combined with the digital communal practice. And there will, uh, or you will see this especially, for example, on Inside Timer, where there are circles where you meet and where you meditate together and churches often don't have those apps in focus so it's like no one knows about this or we know about this but we don't look at them closely um spiritual exercise in everyday life one app that we did a lot of research because we, we can collaborate with the app designer is evermore that's a religious spiritual app from the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Hannover, Germany. They have around 20,000 downloads and it's a spiritual exercise app um, in the tradition of Ignatian, but in a very modern design and language. And the interesting part, it's, it's designed to do short meditations when you commute to work, like in the train, in the bus. And my students had to try this app to, I often work with qualitative analysis, so try this app and observe themselves. And the interesting part is I didn't tell them that this was designed to do in train and buses. And they came back and said, oh, we figured out this is very interesting for the train. It has this time span. <laughs> um, 
we have many multi-religious and trans-religious apps. And this is really a communication be beside church communication. And that was on um, in a study on Inside Time I did, and a 50-year-old woman who said this. We've been on Inside Time since 2015, I think. We used it for meditations, which were really helpful. I have to say, though, that since we joined the circle this and this circle in March my time meditating has skyrocketed. I guess what I'm saying is the personal connection has taken our use of this app to a whole to a whole another level so the interesting part is I'm in different circles doing research and what people start to do is they just had a meeting I'm in a big circle from people with Australia, um, Asia, the States, Europe, and they just had a gathering in the States. So they flew to the States. Or oh, what I see happening now is that people meet, and then there are a couple of people from California. So they meditate on Inside Timer, but they meet like once or twice a month for lunch and talk together. Again, here we have really a blending of um digitality and analog so we are really in the post digital with this um the same is podcast social media youtube tiktok and we have a blending of people listening podcasts for example using the hashtags and community that they created around the podcast for example so just a few concluding thoughts digital dynamics and religious communication blend together and it gets so fast and so complicated as well it's hard to defer what is what and you have to be very quick in um, analyzing everything that happens and very interesting is and here I refer to Hiram Kim Craig from Toronto who says um, this about preaching she said it may also open up a practice of preaching that invites multivocal dialogues, polydoxy and heteroglossia where the space of the pulpit is reimagined and liturgy becomes truly the work of diverse people. And what we see when we, that's why I use the metaphor of the pulpit, is that we often have a shared multivocal power. So people do share power in the digital. It's not a power-free, powerless room, but it's a shared um, power. And um, this brings religious institutions into conflict with powers because they often still want to have the power of interpreting um, or having the power of having the interpretation of the religious practice and thinking of people and the denomination. And I think we need as when we look at church we need to more and more make power a main topic and a critical topic um what we see is participation and polyphony and again Hiram Kim Craig who is a post-colonial feminist scholar actually and she says preaching is never a solitary act and when we look and I understand preaching here as this meditation communication of all the people that's what we see happening as well especially on um, with certain religious apps but as well with the influencers and what she said is preaching is a public theological practice that takes the whole world as its preaching space so we have in the digital a form of preaching location that isn't bound anymore to a room or to certain rules. So we have many, I would actually say, resonant spheres of um, very diverse religious and multi-religious communication. So the individual and the own um, as well power but knowledge of interpretation becomes more important. And I would say education of being able to interpret religiously and spiritually becomes more and more important, is very important for churches too. Um, what we have in the end, religious communication is often in the digital an existential and contextual practice in the horizon 
depends if multi-religious or not, but often in the horizon of the kingdom of God. Challenges for the traditional structure, I will make this very uh, quick, we can talk about this later maybe, increasing choices of people, they choose affiliations or no, no affiliation, the traditional hierarchies and structures are questions, questioned, and opinion formation heavily influenced by media. So people form opinions influenced by media, much more. And um, what I see, and I work with tons of churches that they are frustrated and say, oh, we don't have any possibilities. I would say there are many possibilities for church leaders and churches. And just to name a few examples, there are vital worship services um, and uh, virtual worship services and communities. Often the interactive part is important. What we don't look at are interactive learning experiences. So um, there are so many open access learning possibilities. So interactive learning experiences about spirituality, religion would be very necessary. Online courses, webinars as well. Um, churches can do this. Many churches have never thought about spiritual apps. I wouldn't say one church just should do an app, but denomination can do this. So they don't think about spiritual app, but um, the education and spiritual apps are actually quite connected because the apps are a daily routine and practice into a way of religious life. Online communities and discussion forums, this often happens, as well the global connectivity. It's much easier if churches want to be in contact, for example, in, in Western Europe, with churches from the global south, it works better now. Why don't we see church more as a global connectivity frame and really try to interact with different traditions and different churches to open up our denominational mind? Then digital prayer and meditation tools are already said quite a lot. Online events and online retreats. Um, in the spirituality section and religious apps, there are a lot of online retreats as well being done. And I see at least churches in continental Europe don't think about this. Art and creativity and as well charity work and donation. So we see an increase of all of this. And at least in continental Europe, churches don't think about those opportunities. Yeah, so thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mueller, for that thought-provoking presentation. Um, and I, as I was listening to your presentation, I began to wonder what kind of data um, we will get if we replicate that same study here in North America. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there will be convergences and divergences, but I was just really intrigued by um, by what uh, that research has provided. And you're right, COVID-19 really has um, um, changed the landscape of how we do um, church. Mm -hmm. And we're still trying to um, figure out um, how best we can live into um, God's call into our lives personally and as a faith community in light of the rapid changes that is happening um, with AI, uh, but more so as a result of the last three years uh, when we were trying to shelter in place. And so I do have a, um, a couple of questions, but before, before we get into that, I am just curious if you have a a particular spiritual app that you use mm -hmm. um, for your own uh, sense of um, spiritual life or religious life. And if you can maybe share a little bit about what it is that you're using. <laughs> yes. Well, I, because it's part of my research, I do use a lot of different ones. And I very much um, come from a qualitative background. Even I do as well quantitative studies. So I'm often working like ethnographers too. Mm. So I did use Evermore quite a lot, but that's a German app. What I'm looking into the most, and that since two years actually, is um, Inside Timer. Mm. So I'm very much, um, I'm in different circles, talking to people, meditating, and this varies. 
So I was interested, what does it do with a person when you use multi-religious meditations? Mm. What does it do? You have the um, Ignatian meditations. What happens in the circle? So this is an app that I, as a researcher, do use. Um, for churches, um, like in the German-speaking section, I often would would recommend Inside Timer, and uh, not Inside Timer, Evermore, because it's a very ecumenical app that um, very has a an accessible language is not it opens up the spiritual spheres it gives some guidance and what we figured out we're doing research at the moment using um, spiritual apps as pastoral assistants mm. and mm. what we see is that pastors actually can use spiritual apps as assistants so you can have a community meditating with each other and then you can have a whatsapp or a signal group discussing and then you can meet from time to time somewhere in the location so and i would say you need to find the the, the apps that do fit but i like the apps that open up the mind of and yeah, open yeah. up possibilities right thank you um i am using uh, pray as you go which is an app that i um got to know of when I was in um, England during my sabbatical. So I've been using that prayer as you go. And then more recently at night, I'm using uh, the app called Halo, which is a Catholic um, infused app. And I grew up Catholic. And so before I go to bed, I, I use the Pray the Rosary app. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so you're right, these apps are everywhere and, and they really are helping people. Um, experience their spiritual life in a different way it provides a different way of connecting to the divine and and with other people so Maybe thank you for sharing can, that oh. piece go ahead yeah just want the one to say we did a more than two months um data data generation with with 30 people using religious apps every day a couple of times mm. and doing an experience sampling. So they talked with each other in groups, send us back the information. And what you see, it does increase a lot the awareness of, oh, I'm not just myself. I'm connected to God. Mm -hmm. I'm connected to other people who pray as well. Mm -hmm. And um, what we see is an increase as well in resilience because of this. Mm -hmm. Wow, interesting, isn't it? It really does provide a different avenue uh, mm -hmm. to experiencing mm -hmm. themselves and their connection to God and other people. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Mueller, my, um, I've got a couple of questions here, um, and I'll start with this. What would you suggest our pastors or ministers or church leaders should consider doing in response to the church becoming more and more digital, um, streaming church services online, or they're getting creative and doing a whole host of doing church differently, but there's also a decline of in-person church involvement. What would you suggest um, our religious leaders should consider doing in light of the challenges that they're facing, given uh, the the uh, how ubiquitous digital spirituality in church is nowadays? What I often suggest is I would take the post digital series. So that means I wouldn't just think in analog or just digital digital. I wouldn't create an atmosphere where the analog is the real community and the other is the fake community because what we see is this is just not the reality of people anymore. So I would suggest often to consider this hybrid um, post-digital world and take it seriously and then ask for each context, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. So for certain it does is streaming a service, but why not getting creative, as I said, using prayer apps? Mm. For example, before Easter, 40 days before Easter, why not using a, a spiritual religious app before Easter, meeting um, on Zoom or opening up a Signal or a WhatsApp chat or whatever, to share and meeting them in a location and eating together. So mm -hmm. really combining mm -hmm. the things. Mm -hmm. And I think this becomes more and more necessary. So we need to get past the thought that being church in the digital is just streaming a service. Mm -hmm. 
and we need to get as well more fluid in our thinking because education, spiritual formation, spirituality, meditation, worship or uh, preaching often blends so much. Mm -hmm. um, so what does it mean to preach in a post-digital world? Maybe it's world, it maybe it's a very participatory format where we share the Bible and get the thoughts of everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's not just 30 minutes of monologue mm -hmm. and so on. And and Dr. Mueller, you, you did just publish a book on preaching and um uh, and, and and maybe maybe you can say a little bit more about that because I'm sure our um, people who will be watching this uh, this video will benefit greatly from this resource that you just recently um, published on on preaching. Yeah, I can do that. It's still in German, and I, I'm translating it at the moment. I hope it comes out next year in English. So it's transformative homiletics, preaching beyond the pulpit. But what we did as well, I wrote it with a good friend. We looked as well at the at the post digital society and asked, what does it change? And so the communication process changed, the participation changed. As I said, the experience of what is a real community, it's not just analog, it's a real community. And when we take this all serious, the interesting part is, as I said, um, the participatory aspects are very important. And interestingly as well, the embodied aspects. Mm -hmm. But I can be in a Zoom service or meditate with an app and this is a bodily experience. Mm -hmm. So um, we try to say, don't think in this just this binary way or this mm -hmm. either or, because in a post-digital world, especially when we look at religion, spirituality, it doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. So there and, is a, a coming mm -hmm. together of the online and the offline, the digital, mm -hmm. and the analog. And that is really the world that we're living in now. And, and according to your research, people really got creative mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and found ways to really enhance the work that they're doing. And um, and we so are so looking forward to um, getting a hand on that, uh, the English version of that book, because I think there is so much there that our pastors everywhere can can learn from. And, and so um, we hope that that will get translated um, very, very soon. Um, Dr. Mueller, what other challenges do you think might we be facing, you know, as a community of faith, as people who um, have a religious life and seeing that as 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 um, part of our ways of being in the world? What other challenges do you think might we be facing in light of the rapid changes in technology, in light of, say, the trauma that we're still trying to kind of get, come to grips with as a result of COVID-19 and all that? Mm -hmm. What I would say is plurality is increasing or mm -hmm. diversity is increasing. And that means as well that the, the plurality and the diversity of opinions, religious opinions, spiritual experiences I can access easily through the digital is increasing. So um, there are more influences I naturally have as an individual and that I need to handle and try to make sense. So individuality and plurality come really together in the digital. And the, for me, what I often use with churches is I, I when you use the cell phone, I mean, this is, oh, my screen doesn't show it, but this is like a key or a door and it opens the door to to many parts of the world and to tons of different spiritual experiences mm -hmm. and and to get the head around this that we hold kind of keys to spirituality and different spiritual experiences different religions and blended religions into our hand mm -hmm. and what i think as well and this is not a topic that we probably can't discuss today but um digitalities as well um like the, the question of the data security, mm. it's not a neutral place. It's a rationalized place. It's a discrimination place. Um, the programs are written, written by, as an example, often white male. Mm -hmm. And just one small example, we often work with the owl, 
the meeting owl. Do you know this tool? Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. yeah. So this is not, this owl can't recognize female voices or voices of people who are red female as good as male voices. And I mean, you, you're as well the expert in this. There are face technology that don't recognize, that they're good in recognizing white, white male mm -hmm. and then white female, but people of colic, it's more and more difficult. So it's not a neutral place. And I would challenge churches to as well um, educate and discuss this aspect of digital, digitality because it's not neutral. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you for bringing that up because um, um, that's actually what I'm going to be working on during my sabbatical next spring. Uh, the project is on holy hacking. And really the trust there is to make explicit the underbelly of narrow artificial intelligence, how much of what we're using in the digital world is highly racialized, classed even, full, um, comes into picture and gendered. Um, there are a lot of books written on automating oppression, for example, or math destruction. I forgot um, the authors of these books, um, but that is something that churches also have to come to grip, grips with because we're tethered to our phones. And these phones really are a goldmine for some elite um, individuals who are mining data, but can also um, break and 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 post problems in terms of addiction, uh, data privacy is compromised, and a whole host of other issues. So, so th there is a a confluence of your research and my research, and I'm hoping that we could somehow collectively, um, as theologians, um, talk about some of these things because they're right in front of us. And so, uh, my last question, and and I'm and I'm gonna invite you to uh, to wear your your um, practical theologian hat here. How might we do theology in an age of artificial intelligence, in an age of digitality? How do we? How should we do theology? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, that's one of my passions, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think oh, what I see is, that's why I often talk about lift theology mm -hmm. and about contextual theology. Because again, as well there, the authorities change. So theology is more and more connected to authenticity. I know this is as well a difficult word, but it's connected to authenticity. It's connected to what, at least what do people see, how I live it. And, and um, another thing that, that I, I do research is how much theology is created in the digital. I showed you the picture of different Ama, Amen, mm -hmm. the queer um, pastoral couple. And I just, just did a, a talk and research on how they create um, al alternative pictures of family, for example. Um, through their experience, through the Bible, through their theology, and this is accessible on vlogs on um, on on YouTube. So we do have many theological actors, and I would say we as practical theologians, our task is to get alongside, to listen, and to get into the discourse. We mm. don't hold the power and the knowledge of theology anymore, mm. but what we can offer is to be real open honest discourse partners and that's always my wish for mm. <laughs> my research and my wish for practical theologians and may your tribe increase dr miller because you're right um i think we move in such a, a glacial pace when it comes to um, AI, digital, and theology and you are really pushing um every one of us to be in the public square and be a part of this conversation because it really is challenging our notions of who we are as human beings, God's role in all of this, and, and what we're called to be as, as communities of faith. Dr. Mueller, I wish we had more time to engage further on this topic. I'm sure when people start watching this, uh, they'll be curious about you. There might be follow-up invitations from us here so you can fully 
uh, share with us um, not just your your research, but your passion around theology and digitality, because it's very timely, it's very urgent and needed given the ubiquitous nature and power of um, artificial intelligence in shaping the world we live in now. So friends, that's all for now. And thanks for joining us today. A recording of this conversation will be made available on the Job Institute homepage very, very soon. And our prayer is that may we all be awakened to the presence of God in the ordinariness of our lives, in the apps that we use, the online community that we're a part of, right now, right here at this very moment. Thank you again, Dr. Mueller, for this wonderful time. Until next time, maraming salamat po. Thank you very much. Goodbye.